made in Italy means a luxury product handcrafted by a group of artisans in their atelier by the Italian countryside, right? Probably not, because I did the research and also on these other fashion terms to find out what they truly mean. And if you stick around, you might just end up rethinking all your future clothing purchases. Okay, let's get to it. To understand what can be labelled as made in Italy, you first got to understand the laws behind it. It's pretty simple. Italy is part of the EU and so is subject to EU laws. And according to Article 60 of the European Regulation, blah 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 blah. Basically, as long as a product went through its last significant change in Italy, it's considered to be made in Italy. So theoretically, you could have every part of the shoe imported from overseas, then assemble it in Italy, and voila, you have a made in Italy shoe. Or you can import a bag that's 90% percent complete, then attach the back handles in Italy, slap on a made in Italy label, and sell it to the masses who don't know any better. I know, we can do worse. The law doesn't say that the last significant step in Italy must be done by Italians. So it's no surprise why you see bad actors taking advantage of this loophole. Of course, there are good and honest companies out there if you look hard enough. In fact, next time you're out shopping for a truly authentic Italian product, the one thing to look out for is the 100% made in Italy label, or anything phrased similarly. By Italian law, products can only have this label if their design, planning, manufacturing, and packaging are carried out exclusively on Italian territory. But whether made in Italy or 100% made in Italy, what these labels don't guarantee is a humane working condition. Unlike the US, Italy has no minimum wage laws, with government workers often being paid 5 to 7 euros per hour, and much less for home workers. But even with a minimum wage like in the US, this doesn't guarantee that the government workers won't be exploited. Now, am I suggesting you to start boycotting products? No, but point is, don't over-romanticize countries, don't take labels at face value, and always do your due diligence. Custom, in the context of classic menswear, is simply anything that's not ready to wear. Gee, thanks. There are different levels of customization, and because the term bespoke isn't regulated, companies in the NTO and NTM category can get away with saying that they are bespoke. So, how can you tell what's what? Well, it's not about a price. It's not about how handmade the garment is, how luxurious the fabric is, or where it's made from. It's all about how the patterns are created. In case you didn't know, pattern here refers to the template of the garment, which can be cut from paper or fabric. MTO relies on a standardized block pattern, meaning it's a standardized size template. From there, you can only request minor alterations to the pattern, like shortening the sleeve length and lengthening the jacket length. Similarly, MTM is also based on a standardized block pattern, but with even more options to alter the pattern. Lastly, the definitive characteristic of bespoke is having the pattern drafted from scratch based on your body measurements, taking into account your posture nuances and asymmetries. The pattern will likely not be perfect the first time round, so you usually need at least two base fittings to nail the fit. How this translates to a superior fit is another video in itself, but to give you a quick example, even though all three jackets might have the same shoulder measurements, how each jacket lace on your shoulders will be different. The bespoke jacket will look the cleanest since the pattern would have accounted for nuances in your posture, while the MTO and MTM jackets are less likely to lay as cleanly. Very rarely is a shoe fully handmade. That is, if you define handmade as a process which requires no machines. Of course, the hand lasting, hand welting, and outsole stitching on most high-end bespoke shoes are handmade. But to say that they are fully handmade is not entirely accurate because the uppers are almost always stitched with a sewing machine. And while we're at it, don't discount the skill it takes to operate a sewing machine. If you've ever tried using one, you'd know how hard it is to sew a straight line, let alone a curved seam. Many fashion YouTubers will have you think that salvage jeans equal quality jeans. That's a far too simplistic view, in my opinion. The salvage is literally just a self-finished edge produced by a shuttle loom. Yes, it won't unravel along the outseam, but so does an overlock stitch on a non-salvage denim. It also doesn't mean a longer lasting jean because that has more to do with the type of cotton, how it's woven, and the fit of the jeans. What it does mean is that it forces the outseam to be entirely straight. This is okay if you like straight cuts, but if you prefer a gentle taper or a contoured look, then the other panels of the jeans will have to be compromised to maintain the straight salvage outseam, which probably explains why tapered salvage jeans never look right to me. Also, practically all other woven fabrics have a salvage, so let's not pretend that salvage denim is anything special. Speaking of special, this shirt by Gianni Anelli. Until next time, stay subtle.